don't know about you, but for me, one of the worst things about flying is how stale the air gets. All of those people in a confined space. After a few hours, my eyes are red and my head is stuffy and I feel like something has settled on me everywhere. All I want is a little fresh air. So what is it about the air in a plane that's just so gross? Well, it pains me to tell you this, but it's you. It's not just you, there's some chemistry involved, but uh, it's you. Your skin is constantly churning out fats and oils as a part of its normal functioning. Sounds a little gross, sure, but it's all part of keeping your skin moisturized and protected. These skin oils transfer from our bodies onto everything that we touch. In a high traffic enclosed space like an airplane, they're on pretty much everything. And they linger in unwashed fabrics like dirty clothes and upholstered seats and carpeted floors. Ugh. But as long as you don't touch anything on a plane, you're good, right? No. Turns out there's something in the cabin air on a plane that reacts with all of those skin oils, making things a lot worse. Yes, ozone. You know ozone. Three atoms of oxygen bonded together, absorbs deadly radiation from the sun, allowed life to develop on Earth. Maybe it was going away, resulting in the apocalypse, but now is having a comeback. While ozone is sometimes our friend, like when it's 10,000 meters above us, if you get too close, that friendship becomes toxic. The ozone layer itself is actually diffuse, not like a shell, but more like a sparse fog. It varies a lot in size and shape depending on where you are and what time of year it is. Planes can fly pretty close to the ozone layer, some a lot closer than others. You do get fresh air on a plane, but when so-called fresh air gets sucked into the cabin from outside, some of that ozone comes with it. And ozone reacts with vulnerable tissues, like in your lungs and eyes. It readily oxidizes, that is, gives oxygen atoms to and accepts electrons from certain chemicals in your body, like proteins and fatty acids. That breaks them down, which leads to inflammation, sore or scratchy throat, dryness, shallow breathing, all of those symptoms I mentioned before. But scientists have also noticed some indirect effects of mixing ozone and people in tight spaces. In experiments where they simulated an airplane cabin on a two-hour flight using real people, they found that ozone disappeared faster than people could breathe it in. The people in these experiments mysteriously pulled the ozone out of the cabin air some other way. So where did the ozone go? So can you explain a little bit about what we mean by ozone-initiated chemistry? What, what reactions are happening when that ozone is hitting us in the cabin? So air in an aircraft cabin can contain significant amounts of ozone. It's much more reactive than oxygen to things on your clothes, on your skin, and could create uh, byproducts which could be also toxic. Turns out, ozone reacts with our skin oils to form new compounds, skin and respiratory irritants, all on their own. So when you're locked in with a lot of ozone, you create your own personal pollution cloud. Scientists call it the pig pen effect, after the Charlie Brown character who never took a bath. Take squalene, one component of skin oil. Its carbon-carbon double bonds make it susceptible to oxidation by ozone, which breaks this long molecule into shorter compounds with carbon-oxygen double bonds, carbonyls and dicarbonyls. These carbonyl molecules include aldehydes and acetone, which damage cells just like ozone. And remember how those skin oils get all over clothes and carpets and seats? Well, when some other scientists put some of these in an ozone-filled cabin instead of people, these are t-shirts that have been slept in overnight, they got the same result. Ozone down, gross stuff up. In other words, even without actual people on the plane, you still get the pig pen effect from all of the skin oils the people before you have left behind. Ugh. What we need is to not be around the ozone at all. And the best time to take the ozone out is before it gets to the cabin. The way to take it out on the airplane is actually by um, a catalyst that decomposes the ozone back into oxygen where it originally came from. That's where this metal shoebox comes in. So this, uh, this uh, little can here is an actual ozone converter. It's a catalytic converter, like the one in your car, that turns toxic emissions like carbon monoxide and unburned hydrocarbons into oxygen, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. 
Before outside air winds up in the cabin, it runs into the converter. Inside, the air passes through a mesh of honeycomb-shaped passages. The mesh is coated in the catalyst itself, usually a transition metal-based compound, which grabs one of the oxygen atoms and pulls it off the ozone. The two remaining atoms, now breathable oxygen, head to the cabin. When another ozone molecule drops its extra atom, the two lone atoms make another O2. So every two molecules of ozone from the outside air become three molecules of oxygen gas. And this all happens with the air rushing through at 40 miles per hour. You have milliseconds of time for the ozone molecule to find that catalyst, react, and for the oxygen to leave again. The thing about catalysts is that they don't participate in the reaction, they just facilitate it. So they never get used up. A catalytic converter lasts for thousands of flights before it needs to be replaced. But not every plane has one. One reason is weight. The more dead weight you put on an aircraft, the more fuel you use to go from point A to point B. Smaller planes can't take on the extra kilograms without a hit to their fuel efficiency, which spikes carbon emissions. With lighter, more efficient materials for these converters on the way, every flight could have one. I know personally, I will breathe a little easier. What's the most fun part of working in this kind of chemistry? The thrill of discovery, to, to discover something that, oh, nobody else knows this. I, I'm the one who found this. Doing the discovery in the lab, hands on. I'm like a little kid in the candy store, right? That warms my scientist heart. I love that. That's the perfect answer.